Hey guys, I just finished building this custom PFSense router and firewall. In this video, we're going to discuss the hardware I selected and walk through the entire installation and configuration process. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll walk away able to build your own or at least having learned something. Now this is going to be a fairly small build, so all of the components we need are already laid out in front of us here. I'll be using a Supermicro X10 SDV motherboard. More specifically, this is the 4C-TLN2F variant. Features a Xeon D1521 CPU. This is an embedded CPU, meaning it's not removable from the motherboard. It features a 2.4 gigahertz base clock, four core, eight threads, 45 watts TDP. This is an active cooled CPU. As you can see, there's a fan on top of it. This is not the most recent CPU. It was launched in 2015. However, it's still a great processor and very relevant for these type builds. We have four memory slots here supporting up to 128 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC and non-ECC memory. One thing that makes this board very appealing for a firewall application is that it contains two 10 gig RJ45 network interfaces. Now you'll see there is some space to the left of these two ports here. There are versions of this board that do contain an additional four one gig ports on a separate controller, and some also contain two SFP plus ports instead of RJ45. However, these boards will run you about two to three times more the cost of this particular variant. For storage, we have six SATA ports here. You can see this one is orange. It does support disk on module which basically means you have your data connector and then to the left and the right, there are two pins for power. If your module requires external power, there is a white three pin header down here for that as well. In addition to these SATA ports, we do have one M2 size slot over here for solid state drives, supporting the 42 and 80 millimeter sizes. For the case, I picked up a Supermicro SC505-203B. This is a 1U server case that's designed to mount in a 19 inch standard server rack. Now this case was a little bit pricey, but I really like this particular model because of the 1U rack mount and it has the IO ports in the front, making cabling quite a bit easier between the patch panel and the switch. Otherwise, if you have your IO ports in the back for a firewall appliance, you have to be running cables around to the front of the rack and it just starts to look messy. It also included a 200 watt gold rated power supply, now this case does not have any fans and we may need to add one, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Now, unfortunately the bracket for this case does not have the correct IO shield for this motherboard. Uh, you can see there's like a VGA or serial port connector here on the bottom left. And our board has an RJ45 for the IKVM and two uh, USB 3 ports. So I did have to purchase the correct IO face plate uh, for this case that supports this motherboard and this part was like 25 bucks. I don't know why it costs so much when it's just a small piece of steel. And you can see here the additional knockouts if you have the version of the board with uh, additional one gig ports. So, and I did put the standoffs in for a MITX motherboard and then we can put our motherboard into place. All right, so one thing I noticed right away is that there is not a lot of room here for cabling. They have this motherboard right up against the side of this power supply and I assume that's because they wanted to leave space on the right for installation of hard drives. This does support 2.5 and 3.5 inch drives. However, if they simply would have moved the motherboard over to the right a little bit, there would have been about an inch of space here that you could actually route your cables through. So I've got two sticks of 8 gig DDR4 2133 megahertz ECC memory. Now 8 gig should be plenty for a PFSense firewall. I only ordered eight gigs, however, the seller sent me two sticks, so I'm certainly not going to complain for an eight gig bonus. And those will go in the blue slots. So for storage, I will obviously be using the NVMe port here because, uh, you know, the cost of these drives has decreased significantly recently. I went with a 42 millimeter just because, you know, why not? It's 128 gigs, Union Memory brand. Apparently it's affiliated with Lenovo in some way. And we'll simply insert that into the M2 slot. And then there's a screw that holds it down. So one thing I haven't mentioned about this motherboard uh, that's super cool are the ways you can power it. So we have here a standard 24 pin ATX connector. Additionally, we have a four pin connector here next to the side, and that is not a CPU power plug. That's a 12 volt supply for the motherboard. So you can use either the 24 pin ATX power or you can use the 12 volt power. That means all you need to run this board is a 12 volt power source. You don't even need this ATX power supply. So there's a lot of really cool features built into this motherboard for the size that it is. Yeah, all right, so I think I got that wiring nicely tied up there. Um, I don't like that it's so close to this memory stick here. I really wish there was a bit more space, but there's not, so that's what we have to work with. So the last connection I have to make is the uh, front panel display. 
Supermicro still has a standard connector, which is super nice. So that'll go back here to this rear connector by the SATA ports that is labeled JF1. And uh, based on looking at this board, I can see the pins closest to the SATA connectors are labeled pins one and two. And uh, when you have a standard ribbon cable like this, pin one is indicated by the red line. Uh, so this connector needs to twist around like this. There is a lot of extra space in this case. That's why I'm saying if they just move this motherboard over like an inch, they would have had plenty of room for these cables. All right, so first we'll go to pfsense.org. I'm gonna download the PFSense software. On the top right, there is a download button. We're downloading the Community Edition. Architecture is x64 or 64-bit. And for the installer, I want the DVD image ISO. Even though I'll be running this to a flash drive, I still want the standard ISO file and go ahead and click download. And once that's downloaded, I typically use Rufus or Rufus. I'm not really sure how you pronounce it, to be honest. Uh, to write that to a flash drive. So we'll click our two gig flash drive here and then click select to browse to your ISO file. And it'll give you a warning about the file format. That's perfectly fine. Just click OK. And when you're ready to write that, click start. It's going to warn you that you're destroying data on your flash drive. So make sure you have the correct disk selected and then click OK. And it'll take about two or three minutes to write this. It's a small file, so it goes quickly. So we've got our boot flash drive and we have our IPMI connection. Okay, so we're at our server remote console here. We're going to go ahead and power it on. Before we install this software, we'll want to boot into the BIOS menu here. There's a couple of settings we'll want to change. Uh, going to go to the advanced tab, CPU configuration, all the way down at the bottom where it says advanced power management. And first we'll want to go down to CPU T-state control and turn that on. That's going to allow it to throttle down the CPU to save power, especially when it's idle. We'll also want to go up to CPU P-state control and change uh, boot performance mode to max efficient. Um, and again, that's just going to reduce power consumption. The combination of both of those settings will knock about 10 to 12 watts off uh, when the system is idle. And considering this is a firewall, it's probably going to be sitting idle most of the time or near idle. Uh, and then the last setting we want is to go to the boot tab. And by default, this board is set up for dual booting. We're going to change this to UEFI. Go ahead and save those changes and restart. All right, this time we're going to press F11 to get to the boot menu. From the boot menu, we want to select the option that refers to our flash drive with the installer loaded on it. And for me, this is UEFI 8.07. <clears throat> All right, so you'll want to read the copyright and trademark notices, and if you agree, click accept. Um, so we're going to install. Most of the options in here, we're just going to be selecting defaults. There's nothing too uh, crazy going on. Default key map, and we'll go with the default ZFS partition type. And we only have one drive installed in the system. However, if you have multiples, you could set up a RAID configuration. Uh, pool name PFSense is fine, 4K sectors. Uh, swap size is one gig. We're going to leave that at default. I don't anticipate needing more than one gig. I have 16 gigs of memory in the server. No redundancy. Like I said, I only have one disk installed. And I'm going to install this to the NVMe, which is this disk that says NVD0. So I'll check that and click OK. Yes, I am sure I want to destroy data on that disk. Make sure you have the correct disk selected. Uh, so it's going to copy the files over from the flash drive. It's going to extract them and do some checksum checking. Uh, this will take a few minutes, so we'll be back when it completes. All right, the installation is now completed. It's asking us if we want to open a shell to make any changes. I'm going to answer no, and I want to reboot. And once it shuts down completely here, you'll want to remove the flash drive before it starts up again. Uh, so we're started up to the point now where it realizes we haven't configured our interfaces yet. Uh, so it's asking us if we want to set up VLANs. We're going to answer no to this because this is going to be an entirely separate topic in a future video. We need to tell it which of the two interfaces goes to our WAN or the internet side and the LAN or the local network side. So for the WAN side, I'm going to use interface 1x0, which on this particular motherboard is the bottom of the two interfaces. And that leaves IX1 for the LAN or the local side. And we're just confirming our changes there. We have WAN is on interface zero and LAN is on interface one. Yes, I want to proceed. Uh, so now we're on the typical startup screen you'll see when you boot up PFSense. And uh, 
And as you can see, we have no WAN IP assigned yet because we haven't plugged in our modem and it's assigned a static IP in the 1.1 range. Uh, so before we actually connect this onto our network, we need to uh, change this IP so it's in the range we want to use and also make sure DHCP is disabled because I still have my primary router installed and I don't want these two fighting for which one is uh, authoritative in terms of DHCP. So we're going to use uh, option two here, set interface IP addresses. And I'm setting the LAN address, 192.168.0.2. So 192.168.0.1 is my current firewall. So we'll call this one .2. Uh, and then once I make the swap, I'll go back and change this to .1. And the subnet is a slash 24 range. Now it's asking for an upstream gateway address. If you're installing this as your primary router, you'll leave this blank. Uh, but in my case, I already have a router in place and I haven't made the swap yet. So I'm gonna put the address of my current router in here, which again is 192.168.0.1. I do not use IPv6, so I'll leave that blank. And no, I do not want DHCP enabled. And we'll put the web configurator back to yes, or default rather. So we now see it has a LAN address of 192.168.0.2. So I should be safe to go ahead and plug in the ethernet cable that goes back to my switch. And if we did everything correctly, I should be able to enter this IP address into my web browser. And I have the PFSense login screen, all right. All right, so the default username is admin and the default password will be PFSense, all lowercase. And upon first login, you're brought to a quick setup wizard here. Click next. If you need support, host name, I'm gonna call this pfsense2. Uh, and I usually use the home.lcl as my local uh, home domain. I probably should get an actual registered domain name would help with certificates, but, and your time zone information if you need to make a change to that. WAN interface is going to be DHCP for me. That's going to be uplinked to the uh, cable modem. Um, this all pertains to the WAN side again. Next, the LAN IP address. We already configured it at 192.168.0.24 on a 24 submask. Your new admin password because you definitely do not want the default. And reload. All right, so we'll click finish and we're done. So here is our freshly installed PFSense firewall. So next I'll go through several settings I typically change on fresh installations of PFSense and just kind of explain a little bit about why I do that and uh, just things you may want to look at and consider. So under the system and advanced tab, we're in the admin access. I want this set to HTTPS and I usually use a non-standard port of 8443. Max processes of two. Uh, I don't really have anybody else logging into here, but I like to put more than two. I usually use five or 10. Uh, disable web configurator redirect rule. Now this custom port and the web redirect rule is going to play a role in if you want to actually open up and use port 80 and 443. Otherwise PFSense is going to grab those two ports and you won't be able to use it for anything behind your firewall if you want to host like a web server or anything like that. So. Um, whether I plan to do that or not, I always set a custom port and disable that uh, redirect rule so PFSense is not grabbing 80 or 443. And then one more thing to consider is if you want to enable Secure Shell or SSH, I typically turn that on. I'm not sure how much I'll actually use that considering this new build has the IPMI console, which is very nice. And I think that's about it from this particular menu, 443. Okay, log in again. All right, so now you see we're on port 8443 and HTTPS, uh, system, advanced, going to the firewall and NAT tab this time. And the part I'm going to change is uh, firewall optimization options. I'm going to set this to conservative. And the reason why I'm making this change is because on my phones at home, I use advanced calling or Wi-Fi calling for an Android device iPhones call it something different, but essentially it's the same concept. And for my wireless carrier, which is Verizon, if I leave this set to normal, it eventually drops those connections, I guess because they remain idle for an extended period of time. Uh, and the Wi-Fi calling, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And it's kind of irritating because the reception's not the best in my home. And I found that by setting this to conservative, it allows those connections to remain open longer. As you see here, it says it tries to avoid dropping legitimate idle connections at the expense of increased memory and CPU. So by changing this to conservative, it's not going to drop those connections and my Wi-Fi or advanced calling will continue to function. 
And that's the only change I'm going to make on this page here. Next up is the miscellaneous tab. And we're looking for thermal sensors. I want to change this to Intel. And cryptographic hardware, um, I do have CPU based here. So I'm changing that to AES CPU based acceleration. Click save. And next under system and general setup, I use the DNS servers of 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 and 8.8.4.4. .8 .4. Click save. So I, I don't run a DNS server locally, or at least I haven't run a DNS server locally. Um, so I actually set up DNS forwarding instead of DNS resolution. So I'm going to come to the services menu, DNS resolver, going to uncheck the enable box. And this is something I may reconsider with this new hardware. I had you know performance problems with the NetGate 1100. It was just a bit slower than I would have liked. Uh, then I'm going to services and DNS forwarder, and I'm going to enable the DNS forwarder. I want to register DHCP leases in the DNS forwarder. So, and what that's going to do is whenever DHCP issues an IP on the local network, I'll be able to access that machine with the host name of that machine instead of having to memorize those IPs, which of course could change if you're using DHCP. And I also want to register static mappings as well. I do have a few static mappings. And I believe that is all the changes I need to make here. DHC, oh, DHCP must be enabled for DHCP registration to work. Okay, so I'll have to come back and check these later. I don't want to turn on DHCP just yet because again, I have another router already installed. So, and I'll also show you where to turn on DHCP as well. So that would be under services, DHCP server, and the LAN interface. And all I need to do is check this box here. And typically I reserve the first 10 addresses. So like dot one through dot nine. So I'll start this on address range 10 and we'll go to address range 99. That way, once I switch this out, all I have to do is come check this box to turn it on. And I think that's about it for right now. Um, I do need to load my VLANs back into here. However, I'll be doing a separate video on the VLAN configuration, so I don't want to touch on that just yet. I'm going to move. I do like to configure my dashboard here, so I've got the interfaces, and I do like to add the WAN traffic graph as well. So configure this. And all I need to see is WAN. I don't need to see the LAN. Save. All right, so I'm pretty much ready to get this swapped out at this point. I just need to find some time when nobody here is using the home network so I can have a brief interruption of about 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll get that taken care of. All right, so I think that's where we're going to call it quits with this video. I'm going to get this router racked up and in service here soon. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them. Hit that like button before you go. And thanks for watching.